everybody. Welcome to History Valley Podcast. Today I'm joined by Michael Armstrong, and today we're going to be talking about the Gospel of John. Is it independent of the synoptics, and is it an eyewitness account? Michael has a has formal training and has a graduate of a bachelor's degree in chemistry in the early 1960s. He also worked as an engineering craftsman for a while. He published an article arguing that the Gospel of John is an eyewitness account unlike the Synoptic Gospels, and that it is almost entirely independent of the Synoptic tradition. Okay, so Michael, welcome to History Valley. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Of course. Tell us, what led, what led you to conclude that the Gospel of John is largely independent of the Synoptic Gospels and is an eyewitness account? Well, I started reading what uh, other authors had to say about it, especially um, the author of Understanding the Bible, and uh, which is a book published, often used as a textbook in seminary courses or college courses. And he makes a valid claim that the Gospel of John is overwhelmingly, significantly uh, different and out of sync with the other Synoptic Gospels. And uh, I started focusing on the Gospel of John and saw something in reading for the first time after, uh, you know, 39 years of being indoctrinated and programmed as a as a conservative Christian, a fundamentalist Christian, that all blew away for me and I th threw the whole thing out. And then I realized I had not done due diligence by listening to the, the J person himself, or Yeshua, which was his really real name. And so I began to read the Gospels again. And I read the Gospel of Matthew, and I got discouraged. And I read the Gospel of Mark, and I got more discouraged. And I read the Gospel of Luke, and I got really discouraged. And I read the Gospel of John, and I got encouraged. Oh my, I just happened to have the, the acumen or consciousness of recognizing the pattern. So I reread those Gospels, and the same pattern held. Why would I get discouraged and more discouraged and more discouraged by reading the Synoptic Gospels and then get encouraged by reading the Gospel of John? What made you become more, in, more encouraged from the Gospel of John? What's in there? That well, that's, <clears throat> that's hard to explain on one hand how, how my mind became less foggy and more open to what was actually being said. But the real answer is that at some point I took the inward journey to see how bad it really was in terms of my own character and my own integrity. And it was pretty bad. I didn't like what I found. That was really a difficult journey for me, what I call the first stage of the inward journey. The second stage was even harder because I threw out all of my programming and got in touch with what I really want and what I really need to be a happy camper in the universe. No consideration for what may be available or for what I should want or need. No, this is what I really want and need. So what is it exactly 
in the teaching of the uh, of the Gospel of John that convinced you it's an eyewitness document. Okay. Um, pursuant to what I just said, I found in reading the Gospel of John in that context that John has the J person offering to me, to us, what we really want and what we really need. And so, uh, ultimately, I distilled out ten reasons for why it is more reasonable to accept the Gospel of John than to, as, a, as an eyewitness than to not accept it. There is... Uh there's another thing I, I, I like to address to the audience in case they're, they're not understanding. Um, so you are, you are clearly not a believer. You're not a Christian. I am certainly not a Christian. So what is it that you, so what is it that you're trying to say about the Gospel of John, even though you're not a Christian? What is it that you find so believable in John's Gospel that you can try to be very specific about it? Okay. Uh, it is not my role to try to convert or convince. At this point, I only want to share information and perspective. The, the Gospel of John is offering what is called the Gospel or the Good News, which no one believes. And John remarked about that himself very clearly in saying no one believes what the J person was saying. Now, the J person is clearly saying, regardless of whether it's true or not, that's a separate issue, but the J person is clearly claiming that he came that we might have immortality, life without end, as well as uh, other dimensions that we might want, so that we do want, such as not being victims in the human condition, triumphing over the human condition, becoming uh, empowered, becoming equal to the Creator. Oh my, that, that's a blasphemous concept. And yet, I'm a father and I have a son and at some point I extended equality to my son in peership. And if I tried to abrogate that, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have anything to do with that. He would laugh at me. He would laugh at the idea that I'm uh, superior to him. Hmm. What, what is it that, where in the Gospel of John does it specifically make clear that it is an eyewitness document? Well... I, uh, I'm not sure. I can't remember. Was well, it something about um, John chapter 1, or the way it was talking about the Word manifesting in flesh? Right. Was that what it the, was? Well, not, not exactly. Uh, the first thing John deals with is a philosophical issue of of what the Logos really is. And uh, I hear him saying that the Logos is the voice of reason. Hmm. Um. That the term Logos is, is uh, a, a loaded term uh, which, which applied uh, to some kind of ultimate uh, voice of reason. Hmm. 
What's interesting is in I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. In uh, the writings of Papias of Heriopolis, he wrote in the late late second century A.D. Um, some say early second century A.D., but I think the, who, who I was that again? Papias of Heriopolis. Okay. Papias did talk about John writing the sayings of Christ, a collection of sayings of Christ, um, before the Gospel of Mark. Would you say that ha that could have something to do with what you were saying about John's gospel of uh, copying from an eyewitness account, perhaps? I had a really hard time following what you were saying, but my understanding is that the gospel of Mark is used as the foundation for the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, both Matthew and the author of Matthew and, and Luke added a lot of material, but 90% of Mark is included in both of those other Gospels. That certainly isn't true for, for the uh, Gospel of John. And I think most scholars understand that that John was the last gospel written and I think that that it was written when John was in Egypt. John ultimately wound up in Egypt. Well, so if, um, since you don't think that Mark, Matthew, and Luke, the previous three gospels, are eyewitness text, but you think John is even though he's the last gospel writing way late in the game, was are, are you saying that John's gospel is, in, is he incorporating eyewitness material but was not a direct eyewitness himself? No, I'm suggesting that that John was who he claims to be, the the disciple that... John Simpson. Yeah, right, right. And that he was there and saw with his own eyes and heard with his own ears. But his message and understanding of what that was all about is so radical it's unbelievable nobody believes it I had a I had an uh, an impossible challenge and I basically uh, cried out to God uh, you know come on by your own reasoning uh, nothing is by the J person's own reasoning, nothing is credible unless there's a second witness. And I, I only have John uh, claiming this outrageous paradigm, this outrageous understanding that we're literally, uh, in, in the most important way, uh, sons of God and children of God, and therefore... Uh, the the creator is extending equality to us peership and equality and why not because a peership relationship is the very best relationship it's the relationship that i want to have with other people i don't want to relate to other people as inferior of course but neither do i want to relate to them as superior and Please. I certainly have a peership relationship with my son. So do you think that the... Let me rephrase that. So you must think that the author of John's Gospel, whom you identify as John the Apostle himself, is... Um, you think that John was alive, knew Jesus Christ, and he, he was aware of him, he, therefore he's an eyewitness, and uh, and you think he lived long enough to write after the Gospel of Luke. So, in, uh, in other words, let me add to that to, to make it more understandable. How long do you think the Gospels were written after Jesus, on top of what I just asked you? Okay, I'm... Uh the volume 
that I'm getting from you is a little bit too low for me to clearly follow what you're saying. Mm, I'm really close to the microphone, so I don't. Okay. Let me try to. I'll, I'll, I'll re ask the question and raise my voice. Is this better? Yes. Okay. So since you think that John is an eyewitness to Jesus and his teachings when he was alive, and you think he lived long enough to write after the Gospel of Luke, I yes. therefore ask you, how long did it take for the Gospels to get written after Jesus? And what, and what, in other words, what is the distance chronologically between when the Gospels were written and when Jesus died? How many decades? Um, I think scholarship generally agrees that John was written about 40 years later. Okay. Which would have made John approximately 60 years old or 60 to 65. And uh, what about Mark, Matthew, and Luke? Well, I've already stipulated that Matthew and Luke were largely based upon the Gospel of Mark, and so they were developed uh, sometime between when Mark first uh, uh, was chronicled and, uh, you know, before the Gospel of John was written. Okay. Um the Gospel of John, how, from your point of view, how different is it from the synoptics? And how, how is it more compatible with what the historical Jesus said, not just, not just being an eyewitness document? Well, significant uh, aspects of John are that John deals with the real issues. His document is not just uh, documental. Uh, he is not just uh, providing uh, a chronicle of of aspects, but he's dealing with the real issues, the salient issues, the ultimate issues. Hmm. What kind and of issues is he talking about? Well, the, the, the issue of uh, what, it, what is it all about? The issue of uh, life. I mean, we're born in the human condition. Uh, we, we grow, we mature, uh, we age, we start to decline, and we die. Is, is that it? Is that what the universe has to offer to us? Are we just temporary uh, meat sticks with a shelf life and no other option? Hmm. If, if that's true, then the whole concept of a, of a God worthy of the term or a creator or a father is, is ridiculous. It's absurd. Now, uh, go ahead. Now, the people have, uh, in in forty years of discussing these issues, uh, and going to the seminary and talking to theologians, and philosophers, and scientists, and friends, and whoever uh, was willing to engage in a in a serious conversation with me, uh, the the objection has always been raised, well, Michael, nobody believes that. Okay, exactly. Nobody believes it. And, and that was a claim um, by John. Well, if John's understanding and perspective of the, the J person, his his message and his rationale for coming, his, his uh, portrayal of the real creator, his claim that he was the real creator, 
if that's all true then then there's no mystery as to why nothing good is happening why we're still languishing uh, 1300 years later that's that's according to the revised chronology which I buy into we're still languishing under the human condition and we're living in a in a world exploding with uh, just so with, the audience can get some clarity here you're talking about Gunnar Heinstein's chronology correct yes right okay. largely Gunnar Heinstein Yeah, um, I think Sean might be joining us in a minute, but here's another question I have for you in the meantime. Okay. Uh, the, did John, do you think that John had got into arguments, perhaps heated arguments with the author of the offers of the synoptic gospels and non eyewitnesses? Well, uh, let's just say something like Paul and his epistles coming into conflict with Ke uh, Kephas, James, and uh, John, the pillars of the church. Okay. What, one of the great issues is what happened to John and what happened to Thomas. Uh, the, the instructions of Jesus, or I, I want to say Yeshua, um, were, were kind of simple and straightforward. We were supposed to uh, believe what he said and love one another as he loved us well that's a really the second part is a really difficult thing to do when everybody's on a different page and uh, everybody's got their head into a, a radically false paradigm of reality of creation uh, we're living in in a world exploding with different ideas now the the noise level is going way way up so uh, but John and Thomas are clearly out of sync with the other uh, 12 disciples or the other 10 disciples and of course there were many disciples and the 12 is a kind of an arbit arbitrary thing and it was kind of uh, defined by by themselves not by the J person so uh, the bottom line though is that for whatever reason Thomas went off to Ceylon and John went off to Egypt even the two of them couldn't hang together and get along. So John was just had almost no part in the early uh, development of Christianity in Jerusalem. What do you think about the um, the statement in John ten thirty when it says Jesus and God are the same guy? God, uh, I and the Father are one. Okay, that should be translated, I and the Father are unified. Not that they're the same identical uh, agency. The paradigm that I think makes the most sense is that the J person was the originator of all things but in creating other human beings that's of course given that the creator is totally and only human in nature that uh, he would have children and uh, th would uh, grant them peership and equality and a full share of, of every aspect of knowledge and empowerment, whatever. In other words, 
peership gods, peership creators. Hmm. Well, okay. Something went wrong, clearly, at some point. And what's called sin entered the, entered the realm of the universe. Well, the word sin really means uh, uh, it doesn't mean behavior. It means holding on to, choosing to believe, holding on to, and promulgating a false concept of God, a misunderstanding. What do you think the reason was that Jesus was crucified? Okay. Um, there, there are different answers to that question. They're all related. Uh, the J person uh, or Yeshua was not successful in having his message received. From my perspective, the disciples, which were largely self-chosen, they, they chose to follow him. He did not single them out. He, he, he singled out a couple of them, in, and, but he didn't do anything more than invite them to follow him. But the disciples were spiritual morons. They never did understand what what Yeshua was saying to them and John and Thomas both make that clear. By the way, uh, we need to introduce the concept that Thomas also wrote an entirely independent and eyewitness account of what uh, Yeshua said. So you think Thomas was written by the actual Thomas? Absolutely. And the the clincher is that John and Thomas clearly agree and focus on the unbelievable good news. The very first verse of Thomas goes like this. He who understands these sayings will not experience death. Oh my. That's basically what John is saying in, in his gospel. Well, there are some theologians I've talked to that understand that, that that's what's being said, but they say, well, Michael, that can't be true. Everybody dies. It doesn't matter what it says there. It just can't be true. Everybody dies. Well, on the other hand, nobody is really listening. Nobody is following the instructions. So what do you think uh, the instructions are, and what do you think Thomas really meant by that? Like, what, what's the deal? Well, I, I think Thomas was um, getting right down to it, and uh, I think that he meant what he said, that literal immortality of... Uh, Fulfillment, empowerment, what I call the if I see you package. Imminent fulfillment, immortality, safety, uh, security, uh, equality, empowerment, uh, unity, and society. The total package is available to us. If it isn't available, to me, I'm not a happy camper. 
the the universe is a bad place and there's no such thing as a god worthy of the term sean hey what's up uh, you got anything you want to say well i mean i jumped in late so i'm kind of hearing what he's saying and we have these discussions a lot um and you know you know michael has a site you mentioned your website michael no, I have not. Well, his website has 600 plus articles and papers subdivided into different categories, um, not exclusively dealing with the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Thomas, um, but you know, a, a con it's like a conglomerate, if you want to call it that, of historical information that we should read to ask ourselves questions, if you will. Uh, there's a lot of things that people on, that even come on this channel just aren't aware of that we might be aware of because of the extensive uh, amount of research we do. Some people are exposed to certain things, but I don't know if we've looked at everything we possibly can to try to, you know, put ourselves as human beings into a. Uh, like context of, of what 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 is this what, what's really going on what's really happening right here either we're um, a happy accident from you know big bang science or then we're a creation from a god or by a god or even a creator that just doesn't care at all if you really are real with yourself we're born into an indifferent world um, that just doesn't care we can't do anything as human beings to stop is that natural disasters um, from people killing each other, if you will. Um, we have no control over that. We're victims. There's nothing we can do about it. So if there is a God in the universe that's worthy of the title, it doesn't seem like there is one. Because it doesn't, at least from the biblical narrative, it doesn't encompass all of the character qualities that a God should have. So whereas even myself personally, let's just make it real easy. I have children, and my children, one, my oldest daughter is almost 30, 23, 18, and um, 13. Do I want my children to be my peers eventually? Yes, I do. I know I'm their father, but my goodness, I'm getting older, and my younger sons are surpassing me in their physical nature. And I would hope that we'd be on equal grounds eventually as far as our intellectual nature. And uh, that's what I want. I don't want my son to, and my children to be uh, uh, under my authority, so to speak. I want to be equals with them, intellectual equals. Well, does the God of the Bible want us to be intellectual equals or spiritual equals with him? It doesn't seem that way. Do this or else. You fear me, and then you also in turn have to worship me. I mean, those two concepts are even incompatible. I don't know if Michael talked about that. If you worship something, you're giving acknowledgement and or reverence to, I guess, an entity that's providing you with the enhancement and sustenance of life. Is God providing that for us? No. But then fear, on the other hand, you're giving the acknowledgement uh, or praise, if you will, to um, an entity that can diminish and destroy your life. Huh? That, that's not a compatible concept at all. Why would I worship something I'm afraid of? That doesn't even make sense. It, to me, it doesn't. It doesn't make logical sense. So I think the argument Michael's making then is if the, when the J person comes around, um, he's not making that argument. He's not saying worship me, worship my father, fear him or else at all. I don't read that anyway. Um, then it comes down to, well, yeah, why would a, why would a, why would the J person resurrect a person that is dead just so, so they can age decay and die again? I would be like, well, don't resurrect me. I would be mad. I would be really upset. Like, why'd you do that? If I am just going to age decay and die in this indifferent world, I don't want that. I would say, leave me alone. Or then, from a, making a philosophical argument, let's say. Because Christians believe that you know the J person's coming back, and there's going to be some sort of resurrection. Well, if I'm already dead, please don't resurrect me. 
why for me to be a participant in a hierarchical uh rulership where the j person's at the top of the food chain then you trickle down to uh, uh, some type of government system uh loosely like 144,000 and then a multitude well that's still a dictatorship why would i want to be a part of a dictatorship they're just questions, but then at the same time, um, you know, the world is screwed up. Why would a creator put us in this position? You know, people die from cancer, automobile accidents, all kind of stuff, mass shootings. Hmm? <laughs> I mean, excuse me, but something seems wrong with that picture. And you know, we have to, we do have to ask ourselves these these questions. I think, anyway. You know, what's really good with this stuff? And they're just questions. It's not a negative pushback, but they're still just questions. I think that's what, you know, me and Michael talk about this stuff all the time, amongst other topics, but we do talk about this stuff. But okay. most people won't even bring this stuff up and even ask themselves these questions. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, if, if I may interject, I was happy to hear uh, Sean reflect uh, much of what uh, we've talked about and what I and the conclusions I came to I wanted to interject uh, some information about the ificu.com site in that the 600 plus articles on that site cover my attempt to understand almost everything all all the uh, ultimate issues and crucial issues and uh, Sean and I and a couple of other guys have made a concerted attempt involving the four of us on uh, conference calls to identify and sort out uh, a, a few hundred uh, ultimate and crucial and really significant issues and come into unity on what we think and what we believe about those issues. That's felt really good. I have one more question before we go. Um, do you think besides the Gospels of Thomas and John, do you think there are any other independent uh, texts out there, eyewitness sources? I am reticent to say no, but there aren't any that I can identify as such. Okay. Well, thanks for joining me today, Michael and uh, Sean. Uh, thank you as well. Yeah, one, one last thing now. I. I didn't get around to portraying what I think are the ten reasons for accepting the Gospel of John as an eyewitness account, but those can be found on the If I See You site. Also, real quick, it's If I See, and then just the letter U. If I See You. dot com. Yeah, I F I S E E U. Dot com. Go ahead, continue. I'm sorry. I kind of interrupted. <laughs> um, you said you had the top 10 reasons why we should look at the Gospel of John as an eyewitness account. And I'm looking at just some of the, some of the uh, comments in the chat. I wasn't asked to be bought here. Did anybody ask to be bought here? No. We didn't ask to be bought here. We're here, though. And why should I be held responsible for something I had nothing to do with? How, how am I on the hook for what we would look at in the Bible as things that happened in the past? I had nothing to do with that. So I have, I, I'm being held responsible for something that I had nothing to do with and I can't control? To me, that's another incompatible paradigm. How is that possible? How, if, I, I'm not available for that. Personally, I'm not available at all. I, I'm not going to be held responsible for something that I had nothing to do with. And then or else, follow this or else. No, that doesn't work for me. I'm not available for that. 
I'm really not. So, if, like Michael, I don't know if he said, if we're going to believe anything, we have to believe the best. We have to and start to look at things real critical to narrow and whittle down to, well, what is the best? What would be the best scenario? Because what I'm reading in the, in the scriptures isn't the best scenario at all. It's not the best scenario. It doesn't empower us at all. It leaves us in a state of, again, being a programmable meat stick that's just going to age, decay, and die. That's There's nothing else to it. That's pretty straightforward, cut and dry, um, in my opinion. I'll let you continue, Michael. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I have this burning thing inside of me called idealism and rather than try to suppress my ideals idealism or stifle it I've gone the other way and tried to expand it and enlarge it uh, to to what uh, its limits are and that's how I came up with the if I see us uh, paradigm and package. That's how I was able to see a completely different understanding of the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Thomas, what the J person was claiming and saying and trying to portray in his life and ultimately his crucifixion. Okay, I thank you both again for joining me today. This has been a, been a fascinating discussion. I thank the chat, uh, everyone in the chat participating and, and everything that's going on there. And I'll see all of you next time. Oh, hello viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.